And action. Steel, a material you may be familiar with, or maybe you despise it because of your past and class experiences. A material that goes unnoticed and unappreciated every day. A material with a never-ending list of applications and uses. A material people will dedicate their mid to late 20s studying and beyond. A material that's only good intention, right? So much goes into steel when using it in design, and so much of that information is being taught to you right now. You're learning about material properties and behaviors, or even those painful shear and moment diagrams, but it's all for a purpose. This video is intended to inform you about the why. Why do we care about calculating this? Why do we care about drawing this? What the f is all of this telling us? First, we have the basic material properties we all love to calculate. Now, I'm not talking about summing our forces in the X and summing our forces in the Y. I'm talking about the neutral axis and finding your bending moment of inertia. Because it's these very properties that help describe how a steel member will behave. And it's these very properties that will aid you in your design work further along in your studies and maybe even your career. First, let's start with the neutral axis. As you know, this is the axis in which there are no longitudinal stresses or strains, and it is the divide between a member's tension and compression side. Now, what does that mean in steel design? Well, once you can calculate the neutral axis of your member, it allows you to find your moment of inertia for your different axes. From a behavioral standpoint, knowing your moment of inertia can help identify how your member will act when it undergoes loading, or simply put, what your controlling bending moment of inertia will be. This behavior is especially important when looking at columns, like you will in steel design. As you have learned, and hopefully remember, your moment of inertia goes into the calculation of the radius of gyration. This radius is a determining factor in your slenderness ratio, which normalizes the length of the member to the radius of gyration. The more slender your column is, the more elastic behavior it exhibits, and the more stocky it is, the more plastic the behavior. Let's show this on a graph. As you can see from the graph, on one side we have stocky columns, in other we have slender. This is where that radius of gyration comes in and the slenderness ratio matters. The more stocky column we have, the more inelastic behavior it exhibits, or favors the left side. And if it's a slender column, it's more elastic and favors the right side. Depending on if it's elastic or inelastic will affect how we calculate its critical buckling load, but for now, let's just leave it at that. This same behavior can be, you know what? I've said behavior too much. Our new word is attitude. This same attitude can be shown in beams too. And I think the graph thing worked well. well. Let's do that again. Like the columns, beams can exhibit inelastic or elastic attitude depending on where it is on the graph. If the beam is exhibiting inelastic attitude, then the flange is either compact or non-compact. And for those of you that don't know what a flange is, a typical W shape or I-beam has two flanges with the web in the middle. If the beam is feeling elastic that day, then it's considered to have slender flanges, and this needs to be investigated as a, as a potential failure mode. Now I know calculating neutral axes and moment of inertias may seem like a laborious task, but understanding what they are and what they are saying about a member's attitude is important. These attitudes directly affect how you will design those members. Now let's talk about your shear and moment diagrams, a crowd favorite, I'm sure. These diagrams won't go away, and I can't stress enough how important they are. Shear and moment diagrams describe the attitude throughout your member, and when designing structures, it's important that it can withstand its most critical loads. After analyzing the loads a member is subjected to and applying a resistance factor design method like the LRFD method, shear and moment diagrams are then used to find the controlling conditions. These values are then used alongside the steel manual to check the many modes of failure that a member can be subjected to. And as you can see, our shear and moment diagrams provide us with the maximum values, or simply our controlling condition. And we can follow the steps in our lovely manual here, which lays out step by step how we use those max shear and max moment values. Now sure, we can design to just meet that controlling condition, but aren't you wondering what else we should consider? 
A column or beam's attitude can be controlled by local buckling, flexural buckling, flexural torsional buckling, yielding, lateral torsional buckling, <sighs> shear yielding, shear buckling, web crippling, web yielding, and probably others we haven't even learned yet. But we won't get into those, so you can save the fun for when you're in steel design. So why does all of this matter? Well, for one, you need a grade. But more importantly, these concepts will continue to be ingrained in you as you continue your studies. Understanding shear and moment diagrams will help in more than just steel design. So I hope you can give them a second or maybe third chance. We hope this video has kind of helped explain the why behind everything you're doing now and how it's important later on. Thanks for watching.